Have you ever wondered what it's like to be coached by me? In this video, I wanna invite you in to a recorded group coaching call. I'm just gonna show you one little mini coaching that I did with somebody named Sarah, and it starts right here. All right, welcome everybody. This is the group coaching call. I'm so glad you could all join us. What we're gonna do in this call is one at a time. I'll take your coaching questions and we'll have a little discussion. All right, hey Sarah, how you doing? Hi. Hi. Thanks for um for answering my question. Um, well, I was wondering. So, I think um my partner and I we're triggering each other a lot. Like um, you know, triggering. We both had difficult childhoods, and we we trigger each other very quickly, and then we argue, and then becomes very dramatic very quickly. So, um, I want to stay with him. It's not. That I want to leave. So I was wondering what, what would you advise? Oh, that's such a good question. And I think it's so common for couples where at least one person, if not both people have CPTSD. And honestly, in my experience, if one person has CPTSD uh, and there's a lot of fighting, the other one will start to have symptoms similar to the, to the person who has CPTSD. So it's not the same as having a crappy childhood, but we find each other, don't we? And this is often who we fall in love with and that's okay. And there is a workaround for this. There are some techniques you can use when you know that you're somebody who gets triggered in relationships. And so Sarah, one question I, I had for you is, do you have like, um, is abandonment part of your trauma? Yes, definitely. It's mm -hmm. very, uh, yes. And very strong. <laughs> and does he have that too? Um, I'm not sure actually, because it might be because he was abandoned by his father as a child. So, hmm. what tends to I'm not sure. tends to trigger him? What kind of things trigger him? Um, when I am just you know, when let's say we argue about who does some cleaning in the house or something, and then. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm like, well, you need to clean too, you know, and stuff like that. And then that spirals out very quickly. So if, if I show some sort of dissatisfaction, slightly being annoyed, that then makes him extremely angry because he thinks, oh, I'm trying to do everything and it's still not right. Is it your strong um, emotions that, that trigger him? Or your, just your maybe. anger? Mm -hmm. maybe when it, whenever I'm not totally balanced like <laughs> yeah well so I'll, I'll first address for you because you have abandonment um going on there the, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's something I relate to a lot and I've been through a lot and so the, the 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 techniques that I teach couples come a lot from my own experience and my own marriage and um my husband doesn't have what we have but he doesn't like it when I, my emotions get over the top and that tends to be triggering for him, which is fair. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's, and because I have CBTSD, when I'm upset, that's what I do. And so this really bad dynamic can open up for us where, you know, a, a, an argument starts about whatever, doing the dishes or something. And then, you know, it starts as just a little quibble. And then some, one of us sounds a little bit madder than that. Well, immediately when somebody's mad at me, some part of me that I'm not even conscious of gets afraid that I'm going to get left and it brings out the worst in me. And I start to go into dysregulation. And as a lot of people who watch this channel know, dysregulation is like a real thing that happens. It's really common for people who grew up with, with abuse and neglect, our brains get kind of uh, dysregulated. And so brain weight, brain patterns are going out of harmony and into sort of a little bit of this and our, our, heart rate, our breathing, our vital signs, rather than being in a regular flow pattern are starting to get out of sync again. And it has a real effect on every part of our, of our being. It affects our blood flow. It affects our cognition and, and, and it very much affects how much we can keep the left front cortex going. This is a really common symptom for people like us who grew up with trauma where your left front cortex gets kind of suppressed and that's where your reasoning is, your right front cortex starts to light up. If you were doing a brain scan, this is what it looks like. And there's more emotion and that's exactly what it feels like. And so people who are trying to deal with us or have a constructive disagreement with us are finding us to be 
very unreasonable, you know, not making sense, too emotional. And for them, for any person, and especially, um, especially people who maybe have a slightly avoidant personality, and that's, that's sometimes who we end up with because avoidant personalities, there's a, there's a way that that can work for, for us, but it doesn't work during arguments where they feel very overwhelmed by our show of emotion. It makes them want to run away. And then what gets triggered? Abandonment. <laughs> They're like, I'm not going to talk to you right now. Slam <laughs> or hang up the phone. And a lot of people would feel like that. Like, I'm not going to have a conversation with somebody who's yelling at me. So, so, so the, the, the way to back out of this, and we're, I'm just going to assume you're the agent of change here. You're the one who's being on this call. And so we'll set, we'll set his tools aside for now, but your tools are to first recognize that your emotional reactions are probably too much for most people. It doesn't mean that you're too much. It's just that when your emotions go, it's hard for you and it's hard for everybody. And so to become aware, like, okay, I'm triggered now. I'm going into it now. I'm going into my reaction to a fight. And, you know, that it's commonly called fight or flight response. And in the trauma world, we also know there's more, there's fawn, there's freeze, but fight mode comes out and the, there's all this adrenaline, there's cortisol, there's brain changes. We're saying things that we don't really mean. We're seeing the worst in people. And those are all things that can make a fight vicious. And we know, we all know from experience, having CPTSD uh, has made so many of us lose great relationships. We, we really loved or get into relationships with people we didn't really love, just who could tolerate us and who could tolerate that hard edginess. But the, the great news is you can actually change this one piece of your behavior, which is when you feel upset to become aware of it. And then you go, all right, now I, I'm feeling triggered. I'm in fight mode. And the first thing you do after acknowledging it is to take, take your speed and take it down like to 50%. Slow the conversation way down. You need to start putting gaps between what you're hearing and what you're saying so you have the opportunity to reason. And if you're really, really triggered and you're thinking, no, it's urgent. No, I have to tell him how bad he is. That's then like, not all, don't, just like halt, halt there. You wanna get out of the conversation. It's because when you're triggered like that and you're talking, it's like somebody who's drunk, ranting, you know? Not that we're drunk, <laughs> but it's like that. We're not ourselves. And you do not want the things that you say when you're in that dysregulated state. And particularly the abandonment state, um, what Pete Walker calls abandonment melange, where there's this terrible convergence of harsh emotions, grief, rage, panic, and it's all coming together. And it's just like, Rah! comes out or pitiful, pitiful threats to leave the relationship, you know, or worse, right? You don't want to say those things. Those are very, very damaging to trust and intimacy. So if you can just get a hold of yourself and say, I'm feeling it right now, I don't have to stop feeling it, but I must stop talking. I got to stop saying it right now and go process this on my own for a little bit. And if you have somebody you can call in those moments who's, who also knows our tools, that's great, but that's not always going to be the case. So you pull away. But because a lot of people feel abandoned when somebody walks out of a walks out of the room in the middle of an argument, and that's going to set off their flaming dragon words, right? Which is going to then get you caught up back up in the exchange. You want to avoid causing people to feel abandoned. And this is something you can teach your boyfriend too. avoid feeling abandoned. How you do that is say, you know what? I'm getting really overwhelmed right now. I need to step out of the room. I need five minutes or I need 20 minutes or I need half an hour, something reasonable for yourself and say, I'm going to come back. I'll meet you right here. You reassure them. I really want to have this conversation, but I feel like if I talk right now, I'm going to say things that are terrible and I don't want to do that. People can hear that and they will usually right. give you the space and somebody who, you know, when somebody won't give another person space when they need to talk, that's not cool but this is not the time to fight about whether it's acceptable or not. It's time to just get yourself out of the room. The price we pay for having an argument while dysregulated could be days more dysregulation and loss of the relationship and loss of the living situation and loss of, you know, there's so much loss that flows from the communication we try to have while dysregulated. So it's worth just, you know, try to, when you're not dysregulated, 
do the math and just look at how much is it worth to you to keep your composure while you're in an argument. Take, take those intense feelings to the side and then start using your tools. Now in this community, as you know, we use this thing called the daily practice. It's a writing technique where you can write your fears and resentments on paper. It's a substitute for blurting them out. And, uh, and, and so we get it onto paper. We write, it, we write a, a, a little statement at the end to ask for it to be removed. Then we rest in meditation and you can do a mini version of that when you're in the middle of a fight, step out, step out, use that tool. We also have some emergency tools for re-regulation that you can use. And those are to stomp your feet and do left, right, left, right. And say it to yourself as you feel your feet smacking the floor, left, right. This will start to get your brain talking. Take your right hand and say, I'm taking my right hand and I'm tapping my left shoulder. Say it to yourself and do it. By crossing that middle line of your body, you're starting to help bring your brain back into communication, left and right, back into regulation. I'm, I'm tapping my left shoulder with my right hand. I'm tapping my right shoulder with my left hand. It's so simple, but try it. Try it. You can take deep breaths, but... Um, <laughs> For people with CPTSD, this prevailing wisdom that you can solve everything with some deep breaths is always sort of like, oh, you people, you know, <laughs> deep, yeah, as if, right? But that's not to say, deep, you know, deep breathing is regulating. So you keep using that tool. Don't, don't abandon that tool. If you really need a reset, you can do something like a cold shower, something like that, anything to jar your nervous system. If you can make do with something a little less than that, try putting your hands under cold water or try putting them in warm water and washing them with soap. You can sit in your chair and say, I'm sitting in my chair. And then you feel your own weight in the chair and lean back on it. You can press your tongue to the back of your teeth. You're trying to give yourself body sensations to come back into your body. You, I mean, we don't leave our body really, but our awareness comes out. So we're bringing our awareness back to our nervous system's communication with us about what's going on, where am I? You can look around the room and say, okay, I'm in my office. There's the outside, this is my desk. And you just start to look, where am I in the room? Because often when you're in a deep dysregulation, you're sort of, you've kind of flown out of awareness. And uh, I, I'm trying not to say out of your body because that's misleading. You are in your body, you just can't feel it and you can't sense it. So you wanna come back and especially with the writing, and if anybody's watching this and you want to learn how to do this technique, I always put a link right below every video. It's called the daily practice. It's free. You can learn and try it in less than an hour. And then you can use that and you can, it, it, when you can write what you're fearful and resentful about before you speak it, it'll start to get cleared up. Some of the things that you're feeling are gonna feel much better once you've written them. Some things that you've written are still gonna to need to be said, but you're gonna be in a little bit of a better frame of mind for choosing what actually needs to be said. And when you're regulated, you're not only aware of your surroundings, but you can be aware of another person's feelings. And so this, you know, this like hurt child in you isn't just like shouting out, I don't need you, I don't need anybody. You're not saying stuff like that. You can start to come back and go, okay, I can see you're really angry. I didn't mean, to say what I said. You can even apologize if there was something you needed to, or you can ask again for what you were asking for. And this time you have a chance at getting better results. I've just learned over and over again that when I'm having intense emotions, it does show in my voice and face and that body language is, um, it, it, it's scary to other people and they tend to harden their hearts against it or step back or not wanna cooperate with me. And that's been like, like it's not rocket science, but it's been so helpful for me to understand. And so it's all about teaching myself to restrain what I'm gonna say, restrain uh, the, the overreaction, to just not throw it at somebody. I have never in my life gotten good results with that. And I get much better results when I can just go process the feelings a little bit, take the trauma out of it, and then communicate what I have to say. So that's my piece for you, Sarah. What do you think about that? Is, does that match yeah. some of the experiences you have? Definitely. Yeah, definitely. I mean, he's tried, to, he said like, well, you know, he's threatened to leave and now he's living um, in the guest room. So, which then 
triggers my abandonment issues. Yeah. So. Yeah. I bet. What, what is it like when, when your abandonment um, is up? Is it like a physical sensation? Um, yeah, I just feel really helpless um, and just so extremely sad and just cry for hours. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of us have felt like we were prisoners of that abandonment reaction. Because I mean, I don't know about you, but how many times did I stay in a bad situation just because I couldn't face the feeling that came up because of endings, even in, even when I wanted it to end, it would, it would set off the old abandonment melange feelings and be like debilitating. And I couldn't deal with it. So I'd stick around. I had this, un, or I'd had an, I had an unconscious, unconscious incentive to stick around just so I didn't have to go through all that. Or, you know, I had to go to work tomorrow. I can't deal with this right now. <laughs> And it's like this thing you're lugging around on your back is this reaction that you have. And so everything depends on learning to calm that reaction because when you can, you can be closer to people and you can have a choice to leave when you feel like leaving, when you feel like it's right. Yeah, I don't want to leave. So that's the thing. <laughs> well, but, so have you been yeah. able to talk to him about, have you been able to talk to him about your CPTSD reactions and let him know you're aware um, of it and you're working on it. Yes, yes, I have definitely. So, and how's that? Yeah, going? that's why I'm in the course. <laughs> yeah. So, um, well, yeah, slow. I mean, I'm not that far yet. I think it just takes time, I guess. Well, I have some videos on YouTube. Um, I'll put the links under this video um, where I, I have videos that are for partners to talk about strategies they can use when they feel like their partner's getting all dysregulated. And um, so if they're willing to, you know, work with you a little bit, I always say, you know, no partner is expected to put up with abuse. That's not it. But, but when you know, when you can detect the signs that somebody's getting dysregulated, you can modify your approach a little bit, you know, just like bring it down, um, put it in the gentlest language, create opportunities for breaks. Breaks are really important for both people but they have to be done without a, a threat of abandonment in them. That's it. I'm storming out. I'm going to a hotel. I'm not talking to you. Slam. That's going to set off a worse fight. <laughs> That's going to make everything harder. Everybody needs, but people do need to, they need to be able to express themselves. They need to be able to do it. So that's what we're working with is CPTSD is learning, how, learning the workaround to deal with our dysregulation over here and then coming back with our communication to the person. So I hope that helps. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, right. you. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Thank you. And that is a peek at what it's like to take part in my member group coaching calls. We do group coaching calls for members twice a month. And usually there's 20 to 40 people on there. And usually five or six people will raise their hand in those calls. And I provide a mini coaching. We'd love to have you in the membership program. If you want information, it's down below. Crappy Childhood Fairy membership. You can find out what the benefits are because you, you have conversations with me, you get to be part of a community and you have access to all of my courses for an entire year. There's another way you can be coached by me. This is a brand new thing I'm doing and it's going to be mini coaching sessions recorded to share here on YouTube. This is a recorded session done remotely, you at your house, me in my studio, but we appear, both of us on screen, side by side, on camera with voices, and you get to have a mini coaching. I can't guarantee that I can offer a slot to everybody that submits a question to me, but I'd love to see your questions. If you're interested, you can email me a short video. You can make it on a phone or anything that's easy for you and tell me what your coaching question is and specifically what kind of help and changes do you hope to get from that coaching session? Then attach your video to an email and send it to me at hello at crappychildhoodfairy.com with any information you think I need to know. If you loved what I was talking about with Sarah about how couples can better get along and support each other when one or both of them have CPTSD, I've got a video right here that is all about that and I will see you very soon. <laughs>